So the other day, the CBC put out this article called Words and Phrases You Might Want to Think Twice About Using. Saying, have you ever casually used terms like spirit animal, first world problem, or spooky? Oh, no, you guys. Not spooky. It might be time for you to rethink your use of these phrases and remove them from your daily lingo. Well, excuse me, princess. They went on to say, we ran some of these words by anti-racism and language experts who said some of these phrases can be harmful to various groups of people for their historical and cultural context. And I actually want to start, I'm going to go out of order with uh, some of these words. I will start by saying that some of these words I would say you could say are legitimate, like this one, gypped and gypsy. If you ever use the word gypped, a lot, it says when someone says they've been gypped, they mean defrauded or swindled or something, but the word does have a racist connotation because it stems from the word gypsy. And the term perpetuates a stereotype that Roma are lower class, blah, blah, blah. That's, a, that's one of these words I would say, okay, that's you have a point there. Especially when you have a lot of other words you can use like defrauded or swindled, maybe schemed, cheated, screwed. Plenty of words for you to use. There's no shortage of other words you can use besides gypped. Another one I would say you could maybe is uh, is grandfathered in. I know that term has a... Um, its origins has to do with racist um, legal policies in the United States. Although even here, I would say that if you were to still use it today, most people would understand that you're not a racist for using this term, uh, for lack of better terms. But at least I can get that one. At least I can understand, okay, you might have a point with this one. But some of these words, let's start with um, first world problem says people are slowly moved away from using the term third world to describe low-income countries, but the phrase first world problem is still used to convey something that is an issue only to those who live in a country with wealth and privilege. Blow it out your ass. It can be classist, they say. It can be classist. Really? Now, I'm all against classism. I do think classism is bad, where you group people together based on income statistics, wealth statistics, and then judge them accordingly, treat them accordingly based on their, uh, their, their, their economic class. But I do got to wonder, do the people who wrote this article, do they also hate the classism that's directed toward the upper classes, like all of this hysteria and contempt toward the top 1%, the millionaire and billionaire class. No, 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 of course not. But that's all speculation, and it's all besides the point. Because first world problem, I've always taken this to be a joke. And not a, a joke at the expense of people in poorer countries or poorer countries. It's not meant as mockery of people in poorer countries or the downtrodden, it's more so a mockery of people who let seemingly insignificant problems get the best of them. So they let seemingly insignificant problems destroy their mood, ruin their life. Louis C.K. did a great bit about this years ago when he was on the Conan O'Brien show. I think the segment is called Everything is Amazing and Nobody is Happy. Um, I would recommend checking that out if you haven't. This actually happened to me last week. I had a first world problem. I was driving back from, I think, Walmart's. It was like a 10, 15 minute drive. And my car stereo uh, froze out while I was in the middle of my drive home. This happens probably every few months, once or twice a year, where I have to reboot my car stereo, which takes a few minutes. And that kind of pissed me off. And then I have to remind myself, you know what? 
Would I like to spend the next five to 10 minutes while sitting in traffic? Would I like to spend that time, utilize that time to catch up on some podcasts I'm behind on? Yeah. That would make my drive a lot more convenient, a lot more fun, a lot more tolerable. But is it the end of the world that I can't listen to it because now I have to reboot my fucking car stereo? Should I let this ruin my mood, ruin my day? Probably not. It's not that big of a problem. It's what some people may call a first world problem. (laughs) And then we have words like brainstorm and blindsided and blind spot. The prefix blind is often used in metaphorical terms like blindsided, blind spot, and blind leading the blind to describe the limitation of sight. I can see that being offensive to people who can't see. Well, excuse me, princess. Who knew? You guys, who knew that driving instructors, driver's ed teachers across America were guilty of offending those who can't see by describing visual obstructions as blind spots? They go on to say uh, brainstorm. This is something I did not know. Using the term brainstorm could also be insensitive to those who have brain injuries or are neurodiversive. More important is the stigma that will effectuate about disorders like epilepsy, for example. So I didn't know this. This is something I learned. This is something I would not have learned if not for a ridiculous article like this, but I looked into the history of the term brainstorm And apparently did start off as somewhat of a negative term, a pejorative, to uh, describe, uh, you know, temporary fits of confusion or derangement or insanity, maybe violent outbursts. But now... I think the, the article even mentions, like in the in the modern context, people use brainstorm to mean thought session. I'm going to spend some time uh, doing some thinking, maybe sharing some ideas with other people. But apparently, uh, we got to stop using the word brainstorm because a hundred years ago, people used it to mean uh, a, a temporary fit of rage, and now that might be offensive to literally no one on fucking planet Earth. Also, tone deaf. Guy, if you're using tone deaf to describe people, look, it says, though it's used to describe someone who's not able to distinguish musical pitch or metaphorically as someone who's insensitive to certain manners, tone deaf may not be a kind term to those who have hearing impairments. You hear that, guys? If you use a term like tone deaf, and someone who has hearing impairments hears it, they might get offended. (laughs) So, for the love of God, don't use the term tone deaf anymore, even if you're just busting your balls with friends after a session of karaoke. Like, yeah, nice work up there, Celine Dion. You're totally not musically disinclined also crippled if you you know enough with the metaphors you notice a common theme with a lot of these words is they don't like metaphorically speaking they don't like it when you speak in metaphors like when you say stuff like uh, i i was crippled with fear metaphorically people uh people can say overtaken by fear blow it out your ass i guess savage is another one savage yeah cult savage one of my one of my uh patreon subscribers (laughs) i guess you got to change your name now on twitch and twitter and youtube because you're being insensitive Or Macho Man Randy Savage. I thought about him. I was like, is he being insensitive? Because that's his his ring name. That's not his real name. I can't believe, you know, Mario, Randy Mario Pofo. He's being so insensitive by changing his ring name to to Savage. Spirit Animal, Pow Wow, and Tribe. These are words you uh, got to be careful with saying. Spirit Animal especially. Like these days... 
You know, spirit animal has become a term of endearment to describe someone who the speaker deeply relates to or loves. Some cinema synonyms can include alter ego, idol, or soulmate. I would say that alter ego and soulmate are not applicable to this. They're not applicable synonyms. Idol more so. Because often you use spirit animal to describe someone who kind of inspires you, who you want to look up to. Like if, uh, you know, Tom Brady, some pe someone might say that Tom Brady, he's my spirit animal because he works really hard. He busts his ass. Um, he, he always wins the big game and comes through in the clutch. And he looks fabulous. He's a very handsome guy. Tom Brady is my spirit animal. Or you might go to females like Kim Kardashian. A lot of people might say, yeah, Kim Kardashian, she's my spirit animal. She's a total girl boss. She, she works her big booty off, and she always looks fabulous. She's my spirit, but you can't say spirit animal anymore. Look for other words, because when you appropriate language like spirit animal, you want to know what happens when you appropriate terms like spirit animal. This is what happens, you guys. This is what happens. Are you proud of this, guys? Huh? Are you proud of this? This is what happens when you use terms like spirit animal. Although they do have a point with tribe. They say if a non-indigenous person says, like, this is my tribe, I don't think it's okay despite the fact that they're using it presumably in a metaphorical way. Again, with the metaphors. But saying you're a part of a tribe is stupid regardless. But some people speak in metaphors. And I guess that's the, that's the high crime with the language police these days. Spooky is another one. This is where the double standards come into play because they they talk about how uh, the term spook used sometimes to refer to a ghost, a spy, or something that's strange or frightening. That's how the term started. That's how the term originated, but it was used as a racial slur, I think, starting in um, uh, to describe black soldiers during World War II. But this is where the double standard starts because they have a problem with all these other words because of its um, racist history about how it had origins with racism like gypped and grandfathered in. And, and I guess brainstorming. Whereas spooky has a very innocuous meaning, very innocuous origin. But because uh, some racist soldiers used it as a racial slur 70 years ago, I guess you can't use the word spooky anymore. So if you see any, uh, you know, any, any uh, Halloween decorations like this next October, say something like scary or frightening. But whatever you do, do not say spooky, folks. People 70 years ago, 80 years ago, ruined the term spooky for everyone, I guess. And the same with blackmail. Blackmail. The issue here is that these are all negative terms. It connotes evil, distrust, lack of intelligence, ignorance, lack of beauty to the absence of white. Really? You know, if this if I read this in a Babylon B article, I would roll my fucking eyes. Going back to what I said about the history of terms, this is where the double standard comes in. I looked up the uh, history of the word blackmail. Blackmail, it started off in England uh, in Scotland. The, the origin of the word does not have uh, any racist or hateful undertones to it. But notice how it's all about negative words. What about positive words like blacksmith? Which I guess is out of date because blacksmith is not that big of a profession anymore. Although I know people who do it as a hobby. Or especially uh, black credit cards. Black credit cards, which are, you know, the ultimate status symbol. They uh, Black credit cards are, alt are often reserved for the very rich, the very wealthy. That's a positive sign if you have a black credit card. You know, would anyone confuse this for uh, being a racist, hateful term? Concepts serve an important function in categorizing knowledge and information 
to help us think more clearly and communicate more clearly. And I think that constantly obsessing over rather harmless words is not only a gigantic fucking waste of time, but it can also hurt your ability to think clearly. And I think that the knuckleheads who wrote this article for the CBC are looking for reasons to be offended. You, know, you just look at this video uh, you know, where they talk about context. There is a, a lot of context to all this. When we try to be anti-racist, we try to educate ourselves, right? I call it awareness, history, humility, and understanding the why. Because when we become, when, we, when we're trying to be curious and making ourselves aware of the history, um, we also understand the context. And that gives us a lot of, you know, it makes us humble, I think, in many ways. So she talks a lot about context. She talks a lot about context. Why uh, Why doesn't the users of these words context matter? You know, that's a really good question. If someone uses a term like brainstorm or spooky or tone deaf or spirit animal in a way that's clearly not hateful, then there's nothing to be sensitive about. And if you're taking these deep dives in history to see how people use these words differently a hundred years ago, looking for a reason to clutch your pearls, then maybe, just maybe, you're the problem.